All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be joining us from. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the HAI weekly seminar. Uh, my name is Rob Reich. I'm a professor at Stanford in the political science department. I am currently the faculty director of the Center for Ethics and Society, and I'm an associate director at the newly established Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Uh, our weekly seminar today is with uh, Katie Creel, Kath Kathleen Creel, and she's going to present uh, a paper that I will share that I have already discussed with her. Um, it's a fantastic and interesting paper, and I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. Um, I uh, want to call your attention to how it is that you can participate by noting the um, uh, the Slido uh, set up there. Um, there's information on our website uh, about how to, how to connect and how to ask questions. Um, the format for today is that after I give Katie a brief introduction, I'll turn the floor over to her for a presentation. You can ask questions along the way via Slido, and then I will open the floor, uh, come back to the floor as it were, to pose those questions to Katie um, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so of the, of the hour. Um, let me tell you just a bit about Katie Creel. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford University with an affiliation at the McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society with the Institute for Human-Centered AI and with the Computer Science Department. She is pioneering here at the university uh, um, a new initiative that we're calling Embedded Ethics. Um, ethics is spelled uh, lowercase e-t-h-i capital c-s I'm putting up there in the chat for you a link to an article about that. The idea is to create modules that explore the ethical and social and political dimensions of, of AI science within the core classes of the undergraduate CS curriculum. Uh, Katie is working in tandem with the CS faculty at Stanford along with folks in HAI to develop those modules. And this year has been um, pioneering um, the creation of those and will continue throughout the rest of the year and hopefully into next year as well. Um, Katie embodies what I think is the spirit of interdisciplinary inquiry at HAI. She has an undergraduate degree in computer science from Williams College. She worked um, professionally as a software engineer. She completed a PhD in history of philosophy and science at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, she now serves as a postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford. Um, she has been an extraordinary contributor to the intellectual community here at Stanford, despite our virtual orientation. Um, Katie and I have never met yet in person, despite the fact that we've shared uh, um, community together for nearly a year now. Um, with that, I want to welcome um, um, Katie Creel for a presentation about algorith the algorithmic Leviathan. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. Rob, thanks so much for that very lovely introduction. Um, it's been wonderful to be at Stanford, even virtually, and I can't wait to be there in person in the fall. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen here so we can get started with the presentation. So this talk uh, is based on joint work with Debbie Hellman, who's a wonderful uh, law professor at UVA. And if you're curious about this talk, uh, please check out our paper, which is archived at SSRN. So I've called this project the algorithmic Leviathan um, because when we think about the early modern sovereign, the person who has power over a whole domain, um, the way Hobbes describes their power is that the power is sort of opaque. The sovereign doesn't need to explain decisions that are made. It's systematic in that everyone in the territory is subject to that decision-making power. And importantly, it's arbitrary. The use of power doesn't need to be predictable, it doesn't need to be rule-bound, and it doesn't need to be for a reason. And when we think about automated decision-making decision as it's used in public life, some of these similar worries are raised, right? So I have a, a recent paper thinking about opacity in computation. Um, algorithms are often thought of as being too opaque, uh, but they're also thought of as being systematic. So one algorithm can be used to replace many human decision makers and used over a whole domain of public life. And in an interesting way, they might also be arbitrary. The model might rely on seemingly arbitrary correlations that exist in the initial training data. So our thesis in this paper is going to be that arbitrariness 
in non-state algorithmic decision-making is problematic only when consistently applied at scale. Now, I wanna stress that I'm talking about non-state algorithmic decision-making. So I'm not thinking about criminal justice. I'm not thinking about cases um, of any kind of sentencing or bail. I'm only thinking about non-state decision-making. So I'm thinking about cases like hiring. So imagine you are a hiring manager, you have thousands of resumes, you're trying to screen them, uh, you're trying to find three people to interview, let's say, and one person to hire. So of course you have time constraints, you're busy, you have information constraints, there's only a limited pool of information that you have. Uh, you have privacy constraints, there's some information you're not allowed to seek out or ask for. And the feature to face, importantly, is underdefined. So you're not quite sure what out of your information is going to best conduce to picking the people who will be the best employees for your company. So into this automated uh, space comes automated hiring systems. And these automated hiring systems, um, a famous one is hiring, HireVue, uh, purport to be able to uh, screen resumes, or in some cases even screen videos that candidates upload of them answering predefined questions or look at other evaluative material to choose from the large candidate pool what shortlist should emerge. And the promise of these systems is that they might increase diversity and mitigate bias. But one thing that it's clear that they do is standardize. So out of uh, decisions that were previously made by thousands of different hiring managers, um, the algorithm is now making standardized decisions that replace those decisions by hiring managers. So if we think about the criteria previously used by people in hiring, we might think that some of them are good in the sense that they uh, accurately conduce to um, features that are well connected to performance in the job. Some of them might be bad. They might be based on pernicious bias. And some of them might merely be arbitrary. So there might be some uh, hiring managers who prefer people with purple shoelaces or other truly arbitrary features. So the first point is that automated decision-making systems standardize by enforcing the same classification on every token applicant file every time it's encountered at scale. So the question is, is this standardization a problem? So if this standardization uh, occurs at um, a scale of application to let's say over 700 companies, some of which are Fortune 500 companies, quite large, is this a problem? So let's think first about arbitrariness. So here's my resume. Imagine I'm hypothetically applying for a job. Uh, we have seen cases like the um, recent cases of correlation between a candidate's name and uh, an otherwise similar file being rejected if it had a name that's traditionally thought of as female versus a name that's traditionally thought of as male. So a correlation between a feature like that and the rejection of candidates is a clear instance of some kind of implicit bias. But we could also imagine that there are some features that are just arbitrary. So what if an automated decision-making system has learned that uh, people who went to Williams College in the initial data set, let's say, uh, happen to be really bad employees, and so we're just gonna reject all the Williams College people, or even people who, you know, in the 11th line of their resume, the line is of a certain length, there might be arbitrary features that would be learned that wouldn't have to do with bias, uh, but might nevertheless be a correlation or a reason for rejection. So one way this might arise is overfitting. So this is sort of a classic phenomenon within uh, machine learning, which is that let's say we wanna classify um, a, a data set into two groups, in this case, people we're gonna put on the short list and people we're gonna reject. Uh, here we have blue dots and red dots and we wanna figure out what's a sort of generalizable rule that we can use to distinguish between the blue dots and the red dots. 
So we also know that in our data set, there's gonna be some amount of noise. There's gonna be some data that's not very predictive for us. So ideally we would wanna learn something like the black line, which is gonna be the most generalizable rule despite noise. But we might overfit, we might learn too much and we might learn the green line instead. And then uh, people who are in, let's say, the space of one of the large intrusions of the green line into the otherwise blue space uh, might be later classified as bad employees uh, because of this arbitrariness or overfitting. So for an example of how this might occur in a more uh, realistic setting, just for, for explanation, imagine that you have an algorithm that's trying to diagnose pneumonia in lung x-rays. So there's a lovely paper on this by Zesh et al, 2018. So it turns out that you have two different types of lung x-rays, one of which are taken in the hospital and the other of which are taken in a mobile uh, x-ray screener that you might have in an ambulance. So you make an algorithm, you feel good about it, it's able to uh, diagnose pneumonia, but then it turns out that one of the features that it's heavily relying on is the word portable that's stamped on uh, the mobile x-rays because it turns out that people who have pneumonia are much more likely to be taken to the hospital in an ambulance than people who don't have pneumonia. So it might be that uh, we thought that we were learning something about how to diagnose pneumonia, but actually we were learning this very brittle feature, which is that this one particular hospital's x-ray machines happen to stamp the word pneumonia. I mean, portable, which of course might not happen at another place. So this kind of overfitting to features of the initial input data can lead to arbitrariness. So now we're gonna look at some of the moral features. So we've talked a little bit about arbitrariness and standardization. Now we're gonna think about whether arbitrariness wrongs individuals, uh, whether arbitrariness at scale wrongs individuals, who might be arbitrarily excluded and what we can do about it. So do arbitrary decisions wrong individuals? So the question here first that we have to ask is what kind of arbitrariness might present a moral problem? So one option might be arbitrariness interpreted as unpredictability. So uh, I'm gonna argue that this is not the moral problem. Uh, actors, especially hiring managers, might permissibly choose to change their own goals and thus be unpredictable from the reference frame of what they originally said they were gonna do. So imagine that you're doing a search. In the course of doing the search, you realize, oh, we said we wanted these features, but actually these other features are much more helpful for us. Um, it might be the case that as long as you haven't asked the candidates to do anything demanding uh, such that you would have established what's called a reliance interest, then you they don't have a claim to decision-making from you that's predictable uh, with respect to your initial standard. It's okay for you to uh, change your own criteria. So now let's think about uh, arbitrariness interpreted as a lack of constraint by rules. So this is not gonna be the moral problem for algorithmic decision-making. Even pseudo-random algorithms are still based on rules. Um, what about arbitrariness interpreted as a lack of a good reason? So this seems more promising, but what kind of reason would we require? So, in philosophy, we talk sometimes about demandingness. So how demanding is the type of reason here that we need to give? So one option might be, maybe the reason provided must be public oriented. Yes, you didn't get the loan, but that's because if loans were given to everyone with your qualifications, there would be so many defaults on loans that the housing market would collapse and that would be bad for everyone. So it seems like it would be too demanding to require that every action taken by companies in hiring and lending be justified by a public oriented reason. So a second less demanding tier would be maybe the reason provided needs to be good for the person affected. So you might say, well, if we gave you this loan, you would likely default and that would ultimately not be good for you. You would have ruined your credit and set back your ability to attain the sort of financial stability you want. 
And this also seems too demanding to require that uh, private employers and lenders exclusively act for the benefit of the applicants. So now let's think about the reason provided as being good for the actor or decision maker. And here it still seems too demanding or perhaps just strange to morally require that agents act in their own interest. So it might be instrumentally irrational for them to fail to act in their own interest, but they don't seem to owe it to the applicants to do, do so. So our first conclusion is negative, which is that individuals are not entitled to non-arbitrary decisions unless another right guarantees it. And again, this is why we're not talking at all about uh, state decision-making because for the most part, when the state makes a decision, uh, applicants who are affected by the decision are owed a positive reason. So in, we're not th talking at all about criminal justice because if you are sentenced or denied bail, you are owed a reason for that. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interesting work on what kind of reason that is, but that's not the case we're looking at here. Okay, so now let's look at whether arbitrary decisions at scale wrong individuals. So we're gonna rely here on um, some political theory from people like Elizabeth Anderson. So the idea here is if an individual company establishes some kind of hierarchy or ranking either internal of its own employees or external of people who are applying to the company, um, they're allowed to have a ranking. But importantly, the same hierarchy ought not to consistently dominate the entire sector. Because if it does, if the same hierarchy is used by many or all companies across the sector or across a geographic territory, it can sort of set the rules of interaction within that domain and monopolize access to opportunities. So the worry here is that exclusion of the same people will lead to social hierarchy. And drawing on RANS, we might say this could be a threshold harm to autonomy. So the idea here is that if autonomy involves uh, access to a sufficient range of varied alternatives, genuine choices that you might be able to make, then it's not a moral harm to be denied just one alternative or one opportunity, like a job or a loan, but um, the harm of exclusion from opportunities is of greater mor moral importance at scale. So it becomes a threshold harm to autonomy to be shut out of a significant number of possible alternatives. So the, the idea here is that monopolies on opportunity, like the ones that might be created by the algorithmic Leviathan, can constrain autonomy in a morally troubling way. So the systematicity is the moral problem, not the arbitrariness. But the connection between the systematicity and the arbitrariness is that when a significant limit on opportunity lacks even instrumental rationality, then there isn't that weak justification for it. So the second conclusion, which is more of a positive conclusion, is that arbitrariness is only of moral concern when arbitrary judgments about the same individuals are uniformly enforced at scale. So when is this likely to happen? When is this arbitrariness likely to be scaled up? So the first and clearest case is when the same algorithm made by the same company is used across a wide sector. So it's easy to see why that might lead to the same individuals being arbitrarily excluded. Uh, even if the company pays extra to have the algorithm customized, the same trained model is probably the starting point. But interestingly, arbitrariness can also be standardized when the same large data set leads to similar artifacts in different algorithms. So the worry here is that the same correlations and biases, and especially the same false negatives or unjustified exclusions of people uh, will be learned if the same publicly available data is used. For example, if credit reports are used to make lending decisions by all companies. So likewise, uh, seemingly arbitrary features of a candidate's file that might not stand out to a human reader might be correlated in the original training data with some kind of predictive power. So if the model overfits to the original training data and that causes arbitrariness, then sharing of the training data across different models can systematize the arbitrariness. Okay, so given all that, um, who is the algorithmic Job?
So who is the person who is likely to be excluded from this kind of regime? So the first thing to say is that it, it could be anyone. So any arbitrary features that are correlated with so-called bad employees in the original necessarily limited training data set could cause really any individual to be picked out as um, the algorithmic joke and arbitrarily excluded from this regime of hiring or lending. And this means that arbitrary groups might have very little in common beyond being the people who are re-identified by the algorithm or the group of algorithms. And we might think that the creation of these arbitrary groups would be especially likely if video interview data is used. However, it could also be the case that it might not be an arbitrary group. Rather, we might think about the case where systemic arbitrariness might have a disparate impact on a protected group. So then we're going to bracket that and say, uh, we know why that's bad. Then the decision making is discriminatory. And this is a separate concern from the arbitrariness. So we have a lot of good work on how to identify this problem and hopefully ameliorate it. So we're going to separate out the worry about uh, disparate impact and impact on protected groups from the worry about arbitrariness. However, there might be an interesting and maybe more subtle case where these might overlap. So imagine you have one of these large data sets. Uh, you've created a very high dimensional space with thousands and thousands of features. Um, it might be very difficult to audit for arbitrary bias against individuals or tiny subgroups. So um, there is some really interesting work on auditing and how it is that we can audit an algorithm to see whether there is a disparate impact on a group. But now imagine uh, there is a candidate, let's say, who is in an intersectional uh, group that involves more than one protected category. So how are we going to find whether there is some sort of group level disparate impact or discriminatory bias against people in that group. So if this person is an, in enough overlapping categories, it might become computationally complex to look for whether there's bias against that group. So uh, audits often only focus on a federally protected category, like race, religion, national origin, age, sex, disability or veteran status. But arbitrary exclusion might very well correlate with subgroup or intersectional categories within axes of existing discrimination. Audits for single axis discrimination will miss it. And legal standards don't require audits for multi-axis discrimination. We also have some technical concerns about the feasibility currently of audits for multi-axis discrimination. So the third conclusion is primarily descriptive, which is that any individual could be the one arbitrarily excluded by the algorithmic Leviathan, but the group could also be a subgroup of a protected category. And these individuals or small groups will be very hard to find using existing audits. So the hope is that whatever solution we come up with to address the problem of arbitrariness will also address the problem of excluded subgroups that are difficult to find using audits. All right, so now let's think about possible technical solutions to these, this problem, or in fact, these problems. So what we're gonna propose is fighting arbitrariness with randomness. So the, the, the idea here is let's do something like a random classifier ensemble. So imagine we have our original data set and either we train multiple models of different kinds on that original data set, or we break the data set into smaller subsets here in the image D1, D2, D3, D4, and we train the same kind of model on those different subsets of the data. 
So we're going to try to constrain the models to be as diverse as possible in their token outcomes, so in their classifications on individual people, while still retaining uh, performance on whatever our metric is. And what we're doing here is relying on a phenomenon that's been known for a long time called predictive multiplicity. So the idea of multiplicity, which uh, is often thought of as something that's frustrating or to be avoided, is that you might uh, have different models that produce very similar uh, performance and very similar success on a data set and a problem, uh, but they might have different token outcomes. And normally you would find this frustrating. You would be like, why can't I uh, train a better model that learns from all of these and just produces an overall better outcome? But in this case, we're actually going to rely on multiplicity and use it. So we're going to choose randomly among the model predictions or you know, with some kind of a weighted average and use the stochasticity to preserve the possibility for an individual of being classified otherwise. So let's say, just as an example, we had 100 candidates. And we're just going to posit that out of those 100 candidates, let's say 10 of them are the most qualified. So if we have some model like model A, uh, that model is going to successfully identify nine of the 10 candidates, but it's going to reject Alice. So we're going to say, in this case, Alice is rejected because of an arbitrary feature in model A. So if model A is now standardized across an entire domain, then Alice is not going to be able to find uh, work at any of the companies that rely on that algorithm because they're just going to reject her uh, application at the initial screening step. But now imagine that we have a second model, model B. And this model has identical performance. It finds also nine of the 10 candidates, but it rejects a different candidate. So you can imagine that if we were to randomize between these models, uh, there would be some cases where Alice would be rejected and some cases where our second candidates, Juan, would be rejected. So the hope here is that given that hiring is often a multi-shot game, given that you apply to many companies, not just one, uh, having the possibility of, accepted on, of being accepted on multiple trials will mean that you're much more likely to get a job and not be arbitrarily excluded. So what's the value of randomness with respect to the moral problem we've defined here? So the idea is that multiplicity will preserve performance in this employee prediction task. And to the extent that it does sacrifice some performance on this metric, uh, we know that the domain is noisy and underspecified. They're not unique solutions. And what's morally important is that it will decrease false negatives. And this is important if the model is used across the sector. So if there's one candidate who's arbitrarily rejected, then decreasing false negatives by increasing randomness will mean that that candidate may not be rejected on every time that they reapply. So thanks very much. Um, again, the paper is archived at SSRN. Feel free to check it out. And I look forward to your questions. All right. Um... Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, there are a, a, a batch of terrific questions in Slido, and um, you know because you you bring to bear the training of a philosopher with the uh, um, skill set of a computer scientist, uh, I want to try to take advantage of that uh, um, combined skill set to um, at the very start ask some questions that have come up in Slido and that um, possibly uh, others are also interested in um, to uh, you know, ask you to explain in a slightly more detail um, some of the kinds of concepts and language that are drawn more from the quarters of philosophy or the law say, and then some that are drawn from the quarters of CS. So for example, um, 
uh, one question that's come up is to is to just remind us what this issue of demandingness is, and and how how should we think about that from a CS or algorithmic model perspective? Um, can you just uh, rehearse the the roots of that for people and why it's relevant to this this idea of the algorithmic leviathan? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the idea of demandingness is that there might be some um, more perhaps moral standard such that uh, there are some things that might be good or um, beneficial that might not nevertheless be morally required. Uh, so you might say, um, I'm not going to commit to any of the next examples that I'm just going to give, but just to illustrate, some people might say, you know, uh, it might be good or praiseworthy or beneficial uh, for you to choose to donate a kidney to a stranger, let's say. Um, but it would be too demanding to require that everyone do that um, because it's just an extremely costly action to you and it might interfere, let's say, with your life plans or your life goals. And so while it's good and praiseworthy, maybe it's not required. Mm -hmm. Now, some people are just going to uh, totally reject that whole idea and say everything that's good or beneficial or praiseworthy is also um, required, there's no sort of like threshold of demandingness. But in this paper in particular, um, demandingness has an interesting interaction with a legal standard, right? So um, for uh, companies, whether public or private, it's not required that they arrange their actions for the benefit, let's say, of um, job applicants, or even for the benefit sometimes of the public at large. Yes. It's required that they uh, follow laws and stick within legal standards. Um, and it, it might also be, there might also be uh, further requirements on them given the way that they're structured as companies, but it's not required that their primary benef benefit be to applicants, yep. let's say. Yep. So that, that might be one way to separate those. Great. All right, so at the heart of the paper is an exploration of arbitrariness. And um, there are a batch of questions here about arbitrariness. So I want to uh, begin with one, which I think is a, a relevant question, um, no matter what the discipline is that we come from when we think about decision making in the world. And the question comes from uh, Harith K. Uh, I'll just I'll read it aloud and then expand just slightly on it. The question is, would arbitrariness in algorithmic decision making be problematic? if those decisions weren't any more arbitrary than human decision makers, assuming a single decision maker is dominating the relevant domain in the way that you explain in the paper. And you know what that introduces for me, which I'll also then pose to you is, what is the relevant moral baseline for evaluating an algorithmic model's performance or in an algorithmic audit? Are we comparing to human decision making in this current status quo or some other ideal or something else. So say a bit more about this, this comparative baseline. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think on, on the first question, um, I the, the moral factor that I'm primarily worried about is the standardization. So if if we were to somehow say, okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna take Rob. Rob is currently engaged in hiring. Uh, he's a human being, but he has arbitrary tastes in addition to his discerning judgment. And we're now going to uh, scale Rob's personal judgment up to uh, be the rule for the entire sector or the entire country. Um, I think that would be uh, an equal problem to an algorithmic Leviathan. I think the problem is the standardization. So now let's think about the second question, which is the difference between, um, are, are there different standards for human and algorithmic um, judgment? Yep. So I think what I'd wanna say there is, um, to whatever extent we identify uh, moral or political problems, I think we should try to hold both human and algorithmic decision makers to as high of a standard as we can, in the sense that I don't think it's morally relevant to say, uh, oh, well, you know, there's an achievable fix that we could do to make this algorithm better, but since humans are worse, we're not going to attempt it. Um, if something is a feasible 
uh, improvement, either in human or algorithmic decision making, uh, we, we ought to make it. Um, and in some cases, it might be easier to make an algorithmic decision making because the factors might be easier to distill. Not always, but. Yeah, good. There's another question that gets at the heart of this idea of arbitrariness here and less about the comparative baseline, but just to try to understand the, 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 the utility of the concept in, in the paper. Uh, question is from Naveen. Um, who who gets to be the arbiter arbiter of arbitrariness, and is it a binary concept or a spectrum? Yeah, great question. Um, so, what what is it to be arbitrary? So, one um, way that I've been thinking about it in the paper, in part implicitly, is that the factor doesn't have any uh, causal production of goodness at the job on any standard. Um, now, it could be that uh, one of the factors that seems to us to be arbitrary is, in fact, causally producing goodness at the job, just unbeknownst to us. And so I think one worry that people might have is, uh, what if in eliminating arbitrariness, we're actually eliminating um, some feature of this algorithm that actually did make it good at identifying future talented employees? Um, I'm not sure we have any current reason to think that uh, these algorithms are so good that they're doing that. Yep. Um, I think we, <laughs> we would need uh, some sort of proof that that even plausibly was happening in order to think that these weren't what's far more likely, which is just sort of brittle features that have crept in. Yeah. All right, um, here's one more uh, uh, big picture question about the, the problem of our arbitrariness, assuming now that we can you know, use it to give us some, some do some genuine work for us. Um, if we are using algorithms to make decisions uh, um, and we're seeking to avoid arbitrariness, um, what would you think about a blunt approach uh, um, algorithmically that would involve restricting ourselves to very simple linear models with simple hand-tuned features? Yeah, um, I think there have been a lot of cases where that's been very successful and um, especially in cases like uh, hiring and lending, both of which do have a lot of sort of legal strictures about what kind of factors are and aren't allowed to be relied on. Um, I think that's an approach we should explore more and that there's a lot of um, sort of motivated hype in this space that suggests that, you know, only our proprietary black box algorithms could possibly solve this very difficult problem. Uh, and um, if we don't have a reason to believe that's true, then yeah, I'm very open to the idea of a linear model that just, hmm. you know, uses very simple features. Yeah. All right, um, let's shift just a bit to, to focus on some of the constructive proposals that you bring to bear in the paper to tackle or confront the problem um, of arbitrariness in, in algorithmic models. Um, and and the, some of these questions involve um, randomness. So one of the questions comes from Vidan to ask, can, can randomness create underfitting? And while underfitting could reduce arbitrariness, could it nevertheless have other undesirable consequences? And if so, what do you think those could be? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, good. So one thing I didn't address in the talk is how much randomness. So you might think, you know, um, one very important feature for the success of this proposal is that, um, as Vedan is saying, we calibrate the correct amount of randomness and so that we don't overshoot and start underfitting. Yep. So I think that's a really important question that uh, I didn't address in part because I think it might be different depending on what your precise domain is and what kind of data you have, et cetera. But um, as a more general rule, right, let's think about the problem where we do overshoot, we hit, we're now underfitting. Um, I think in some sense for the purposes of my talk, assuming that we're in the domain where we have, let's say a fixed number of jobs that are being allocated to a fixed number of people, um, I'm not sure there is a moral problem with underfitting in the same way that there is with overfitting. Uh, you might think that would have obvious consequences in terms of picking less good employees from the perspective of the company, uh, but I'm not sure there's the same moral problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, 
there's an interesting question here that I think uh, possibly uh, you are qualified to address um, 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 because you're uh, uh, partly uh, you know, generating the content of this paper from your collaboration with Deborah Hellman, who has legal training. So Tom Hayes asks, what legal risks do companies run today if they use arbitrariness at scale with seemingly innocuous variables? Um, is there any emergent or established case law in the field? Yeah, um, I, I'm not aware of case law on this, but I will definitely follow up with Debbie and, and, and Tom, we can email you. Um, I think one risk is that uh, if, if it turned out that these seemingly arbitrary features did correlate with membership in, in let's say multiple protected classes, like um, we, let's say we can audit for uh, whether the algorithm is rejecting black women, but we haven't been able to technically audit for whether the algorithm is rejecting all, all applicants who went to Spelman, let's say. Yep. Um, so in a case like that, there, there is case law about um, rejection of candidates who are in overlapping or intersectional groups. And you might fall into that without knowing it, in which case the arbitrary features would provide a legal problem for you. Yeah. Good. So in, in that introduces, at least um, um, to, in my mind, one of the things you discussed at the very you know, front half of the paper about the emerging field of algorithmic audits. Um, so a form of, of policymaking. Um, uh, and uh, you um, try to address some of the, the, the existing limitations of algorithmic audits. Um, and so here's a good question from Naveen. You say, when it's difficult to audit arbitrary bias, are you saying that we lack the tools now to do so or that it's a computationally intractable problem? Some of both in the sense that um, it's, so the paper that I cited on this is Kearns et al 2018, which I think it's very useful. Um, but there are some computational limits to, uh, if you can imagine you have, you know, a thousand plus features uh, and you have this multi-dimensional feature space that's, you know, um, the intersection of all thousands of those features and potentially not just one intersection, but two or three or four or, or 10 intersectional features, um, that becomes computationally intractable quite quickly. Um, especially if the algorithm is changing frequently and you can't just you know, ensure that it's okay once, you need to keep checking it. Um, so I think there's both sort of uh, computational and technical barriers to doing this right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk again uh, about a, a variety of questions that have come up ab about the constructive proposal um, that you bring to bear um, about you know, how, to, how to mitigate the potential problems of arbitrariness at scale. So um, a really interesting question here from uh, Irina who asks in the Alice and Juan example, um, does this mean that we accept arbitrary exclusion in the case of a particular job and we just hope that the candidate also applies to a different company that's using a different model? Or are you suggesting that companies use multiple models to screen their own applicants? And then I have a couple follow-ups from that as well. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm hoping that an individual company will use multiple models um, but assuming that they uh, do come up with a short list that on any individual instance, they might um, pick one of the models at random, in which case, yes, uh, from that company, one individual would be arbitrarily excluded. Um, now, another option might be, uh, if people were willing to do this, that maybe what you do is you say, okay, I have these multiple models, um, they agree on a class of people who seem, you know, clearly qualified, at least from the benefit, from the perspective of the model. Maybe what I do then is instead of um, randomly picking one of the models and using it to exclude somebody, maybe then I have this sort of um, intermediate or gray area class of people who are accepted by some, but not all of the models. And maybe what I do then is have uh, a human look at that class. Um, I want to note that having a human look at the class, however, is not magic in the sense that we're just adding sort of another form of decision making that's now looking at that group. So um, in a moral sense, I'm not sure that's actually better 
assuming that we end up with a list of the same size yeah. than randomly picking from that group. Um, yeah. A, a, a follow up to that. Um, there's an aspect of the um, constructed proposal in the paper that's in certain respects, it's a, a, a technical solution um, in, in deploying randomness. Um, do you think there is a complementary or alternative policy or social solution that might involve, for example, antitrust approaches to um, you know, monopolistic provision of a particular algorithmic model in any, in any domain or space? Yeah, great question. So I think the complementary antitrust approach would be great. Um, I encourage much more antitrust in the tech space. Uh, that said, I think we still have some reason to worry that even if um, there were 10 actors in the same space who are genuinely competitive or rivals of one another, if they're all using the same publicly available data, they might end up, um, just because these models are so data hungry, they might end up coming to similar conclusions in a way that might reproduce the problem that I'm presenting here. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still room for possibly policy interventions to try to create uh, more randomness in algorithmic decision making, even if there is proper competition. Yep. All right, uh, um, uh, another question from uh, um, in this area of, of solutions, that, again, that touches here on the law. This comes from Bill Cur Curtis Davison. He asks, on the hiring tools example, one tough topic is that of algorithmic fairness for people with disabilities, a protected class, a, a legal term here, a protected class that intersects with all other dimensions of diversity. So what perspective might you have on this area on topics like unintended disclosure or rejection of outliers? Yeah, yeah, I think this is really important. And this is one of the cases that originally motivated me to work on this. I think there's really clear ways in, in which, especially using um, video footage or a video screening of a video interview uh, might directly lead to rejection of people with visible disabilities or people with uh, ways of talking or interacting with a video that might um, be identified as outliers with respect to the original training data, but might have absolutely no impact on their performance and quality as employees. And so one of my hopes is that introducing more randomness is also a way to um, unearth this. But I also think, you know, this is a great use case for auditing. So yeah. if you can figure out a way to audit for this type of exclusion, then you can also retrain the model directly and you don't have to rely on sort of uh, the second tier or last chance um, randomness that I'm proposing as a, a fix of, of last resort, as it were. Yeah, uh, good. All right, so I, I wanna now sort of, um, uh, pan out as it were to the big picture um, to try to take stock of some of the, the main ideas in the paper and in this entire space of algorithmic decision-making. So there's a, a wonderful question from, from Eva who asks, um, uh, well says, arbitrariness and discrimination or the, the, what's arbitrary and what's discriminatory are overlapping categories. Now, what I, what I take away from your, your paper is that the distinctive problem from a moral perspective or a, a sort of social perspective that we face is arbitrariness at scale. And I guess I, I, I'd love to hear from you a bit about whether, whether or not it's in the dis human decision making or judgment um, where arbitrariness is introduced or in the algorithmic um, um, domain where arbitrariness is introduced. Is, is arbitrariness um, tolerable at minor scale um, um, and therefore um, um, permissible? Is it intolerable but inevitable? Uh, um, when we go to algorithmic decision-making at scale, um, are we only um, mitigating as it were on the edges because there is no domain of decision-making that can wholly avoid arbitrariness? Can you give us a little sense about how we should just think about the moral attitude about arbitrariness insofar as it overlaps with discrimination, because I'm tempted to believe on occasion that um, when arbitrariness is distributed in different ways across many different domains, that's kind of spirit of the idea in your paper, um, I, I'm unsure whether you're saying 
that diminishes the problem, but let's not pretend to ourselves that it's not still problematic. So at best, we're tolerating something that we should really have trouble with. Or is it inevitable and, and perhaps in some level even desirable? Can, can you just give us a big picture perspective on how we should think about the role of arbitrariness and decision making as such? Yeah. Yeah, these are such great questions. So I also just want to pause and say thank you to the audience for these amazing questions and thank you to Rob for picking them. Uh, yeah, so so um, I, I think the original spirit of the question is something that I would agree with in the sense that I think in a lot of cases, um, in, in part because the paper is oriented towards sort of some of the legal questions as well, uh, there might very well be purported arbitrariness that actually, you know, like protected categories is based in sort of a historically situation pattern of exclusion. So um, one example, although there are many more and certainly many more consequential ones might be, you know, we know that there are strong trends in hiring towards hiring people who are considered more attractive. Yes. So that might be something that might appear in a data set if you were training on the patterns of human hiring managers. Um, so now uh, attractiveness might appear in algorithmic decision making as a feature that might not always be unearthable in the sense that you might not always know that that pattern of preferring candidates that are considered more conventionally attractive uh, might be something that your algorithm has now codified or ossified or you know, uh, crystallized that pattern of exclusion. So I think in that sense, like, yes, a lot of these things that, that seem arbitrary might in fact uh, be related to historical patterns of exclusion. Um, so how, what should we think about this in terms of, you know, the, let's say the medium term prospects? Um, I guess out of the options you presented, Rob, I'm most tempted to say um, it's, it's what was the language you used? It's never uh, it's never tolerable, but it might be inevitable yes. in the sense that we feasibly in neither human nor algorithmic decision making. I think should we expect that technically we can completely eliminate it. However, I think it's not tolerable, and so uh, we should try to do what we can to blunt its effects on society. There's a, a quick follow-up um, from Irina in the Slido just about this, and I wanna get this in and then move to a couple other questions to finish up. Um, if we re-describe arbitrariness in decision-making as serendipity and give it a kind of positive valence in our own you know, language, um, might we say that serendipitous decision-making introduces something desirable, whereas arbitrary decision-making introduces something undesirable? And then if so, how do we distinguish between these two ideas? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I thought about this a lot in the case of scientific machine learning and scientific yes. data, where you might want machine learning on scientific data to be open to correlations that perhaps weren't predicted by your theory, but might prompt something that might prompt you to change your theory. So I think this is a very interesting and important question. Um, in the social domain, uh, I think while, yes, we wanna be open to serendipity, um, I'm not sure that it's worth the risk of this sort of serendipitous improvement, given that we often have no practical way to distinguish between good and pernicious versions of this. So yep. I agree with you. There might be a correlation that ends up to have ends up having this sort of causal and predictive power, but unless we can know which ones are which, I'm not sure it's worth it. Yeah, great. All right, I want to get two final questions in here before we end at eleven sharp. Um, there's a great question about a kind of uh, from a moral perspective and how we how we think of ourselves in the world from Marilyn Z, who asks. Can randomness have consequences where some candidates feel they're hired just because of randomness and therefore don't deserve it in the way that other candidates might? Um, so uh, how does introducing randomness into decision making, you know, you, you took the hiring context, it's also, of course, uh, entirely appropriate to think of it in college admissions um, and other places in life as well. 
there are proposals for what it's worth to the audience that in, in selective college admissions, random selection after you establish a final, you know, highly qualified pool is the morally superior way of choosing. But I wonder how it interacts in your mind, Katie, with this idea that we wish to feel like we were chosen on our merits or we deserve to be selected rather than some type of randomness as the explanation. Yeah. Marilyn, if you're my advisee, shout out. Thanks for the question. Um, so I think part of the sort of like subtext of this whole project is that I do want to encourage a little bit the decoupling of um, pure, you know, uh, dessert and this sort of like, um, yeah, the, the feeling of dessert as being a, a positive thing in the sense of, I think the proposals to uh, randomize once you've established a candidate pool are good and that we should be um, slightly less confident than we are that, you know, there's exactly a fixed number of candidates that are good on certain metrics, um, many of which are, uh, the metrics themselves are very engineered to find sort of uh, conventional types of success in a way that's often engineered to support the existing social hierarchy. So I do want to sort of like decouple those things a bit. Great. All right. Um, in the spirit of the multidisciplinary inquiry, I want to get in um, Michael uh, um, uh, Failing's question here at the end. Um, very big picture and say what you will about it here, please. How is your work, Katie, informed by the vast amount of, of scholarship on human choice under uncertainty, such as the technical issues and moral implications of things like value presumptions of a model of choice or the implications of sensitivity and specificity of a choice model? Yeah, I think it's tremendously valuable. And one of the things I'm most excited about in the sort of next wave of uh, machine learning and uh, social implications in the sort of technical space is for more people to make these connections. And I especially liked the point you highlighted about value presumptions of the model. I think that's extremely important and something that uh, people like um, Gabby have really done a lot to highlight, which is that these models do all have value presumptions and it would be helpful to unearth them. Um, so thanks a lot to everyone for the questions and please feel free to email me if you want to continue the discussion. Yeah, um, thank you to all of the uh, participants in, in this webinar. Uh, the questions on Slido um, as, as often were, were, were more than I could possibly get in, but uh, um, absolutely fantastic questions. And um, Katie, I want to express my, my thanks to you for uh, such stimulating and, in, and important work. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this webinar uh, will uh, be archived um, on, on the HAI, uh, either YouTube channel or on our own website, or possibly both. And uh, as Katie uh, mentioned, you can feel free to contact either me or HAI or Katie. Our emails are easily discoverable on the various Stanford websites. So with that, I want to bring our seminar to a conclusion and uh, express my gratitude once again, Katie, for, for your work. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to HAI for hosting this wonderful series. Bye, everybody.